I'm so excited. Welcome everybody to today's Planning Pants. And I'm joined by the fabulous Linda Wright. Now, Linda, firstly, Planning Pants. Why didn't we call it Planning Briefs or something like that? Right, well, uh, we had this conversation and it was a long conversation. And what we started with was planning shorts. Because we thought, we'll make it short because nobody wants to listen to anything about time planning for longer than 10 minutes. And even then, then they're probably going to go to sleep. Um, we were going to call it planning shorts because it was going to be short and sweet and the kind of stuff that people can watch on their smartphones and flip in and out of and then think, oh, do you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to have my glass of wine. Um, or we then thought of it and then we looked at it and somebody else had already done it. So we thought, let's be clever. Let's not do planning shots. Let's do planning briefs. The, there's a theme here. You can see where we're going with this. But then some very clever barristers put on social media planning briefs or planning in brief something like that so that sort of knocked that on the head hence we get to planning pants, planning pants because planning can be pants most of the time that's actually a very very old-fashioned sort of you know the youth used to say it i don't think the youth say it anymore but that's what we've come up with planning pants well i think we ended up with pants because Everything else had gone and we went, oh, pants. Yeah, oh, pants. And that was <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so there you go, everybody. That's why he's planning pants. And Linda, can you just share with everybody why we should listen to you? What is special about your knowledge on planning, apart from the fact that it's pants? <laughs> <laughs> Glad you didn't say what's so special about me because I was going to say, well, that's going to take about 30 seconds. Um, no, well, from a planning point of view, I've, I've well, you can see the colour of my hair. Um, I've been in this industry for a long, long time. <laughs> yes, now. Um, I, started in, I started in planning when I was 18 and actually it's been very good to me. It's taken me around the world. It's taken me to Bermuda. I used to work uh, for the government of Bermuda in planning. I've worked for councils. I've worked for blue chip companies for telecommunications. I've worked for volume house builders. So, and, and then I've actually, before COVID came in this year, it was going to be my 10th anniversary. And I was going to do a whole celebration of my 10th anniversary in March. That didn't happen, did it? There's something got in the way. So, um, I've been doing this as a private consultant, helping people and doing battle with councils for 10 years now. So I am have come at this from all sides. I know what the councils can do. I know what, I understand the commerciality of either investors or landlords or commercial companies because of the volume house builders and, and the blue chip companies I've worked for. But also I try and temper it with a bit of common sense because planning sometimes can get a bit silly. So I've got a lot of experience. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I'm passionate still, God knows how, about it. And what I want is happy clients. I want to get planning permission. I don't want people to be miserable. And if you're not going to get something and you're not going to get planning permission or the planning permission that you are looking for, I will tell you uh, it's very rare that I get a refusal. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, we get drawings. We, I send my guys out and they're even, they're going out now this week. So it's all started to kick off. Um, we do the drawings. They're very simple. They're uh, detailed enough for the planners and we get planning permission with those drawings. And sometimes it's more of a struggle than others. And sometimes it sets through. It just depends what we're doing. So that is a, a, a brief run through of my planning life. And I've known you probably eight years or thereabouts. And Linda is what she says on the tin. Absolute ball of fun. Bit of a bit of a Rottweiler, dare we say, when it comes to uh, getting the bit between the teeth and having it out with the planners and gets results. So uh, get in contact with Linda. So let's help the audience. I mean, the, there's a lot of jargon out there. And let's use this as an introduction to debunk a few of the myths. Use classes and planning classes. 
people get confused. Now, everybody's heard of an A1 shop, a C3 residential house, but then you go into class G's and class M's and it all gets confusing because there isn't a, a use class G or M. So can you help us out with that one, Linda? Yeah, and do you know what? I can understand perfectly because wouldn't it have been nice if they hadn't called, if they just kept the use classes as use classes and not put the word class or classes into anything else. It is confusing. So what, what, there are two entirely different bits of regs that you need to know about. The first one is the use classes order. Now, this was revised, it, we were going back to 1987 and we were still using the 1987 use classes order. You that don't has, look old enough. <laughs> that is, um, has been revised, but the problem is it gets revised every year and it's difficult to keep up with all of the changes in it. So that use classes order gives you what the actual, literally does what it says on the tin, what the use of a property or land is. And it's, please don't go to the council, phoning up the council, asking them what the use class of a property is. They won't be able to tell you because they don't know. Because if something has changed the use without, with or without planning permission, it's the last known use of that property. So if, for example, a shop has been a shop for 30 years, its use is a class A1, as you quite rightly said, retail. And there's a list of, of what type of retail that will cover in the use classes order. That Again, and, and the use classes order includes this delightfully named sui generis, Latin for of its own kind. And everybody spells it wrong. It's hilarious. Anyway, so sui generis means they lump everything into that because they don't know where else to put something. So it goes from class A1 all the way through. I'm not going to name all the classes because we'll be here all day. And we are going to do that later in this, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling like Game of Thrones. I'm feeling like it's series one, ep one. And then you, you go all the way through the series. So there's going to be a, a little mini series of not exactly Game of Thrones, but Linda with wings. But there we go. Um, you little devil. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll get the horns for next time when I've had my hair cut. Um, so that's use classes order. It is an entirely separate entity. Don't get it confused with anything else. And it includes sui generis. And we, we are gonna go through this in more detail to explain to you what you can and can't. Because you can move between use classes with permit, under permitted development rights, some things, but there's a lot of things you just cannot do under permitted development rights, moving use classes. The second thing is the General Permitted Development Order. I could give it its full title and say the Town and Country Planning Act, Engl England, because England and Wales are, are different. Got to be careful with that. It's the first consolidated uh, General Permitted Development Order, and that does what it says on the tin. It tells you what is permitted development. It goes all through, it's 164 pages, and it goes all the way through all of the things that are permitted. So, General Permitted Development Order tells you what you can do under permitted development rights, but it also gives you the conditions as what, what you will not be able to do. In the General Permitted Development Order, we have classes, and unfortunately, we've got class A, class B, class C, and every, well, probably lots of people will know, class O is the office to residential conversion. So a lot of people are familiar with this, but then it just, it, it sort of messes with your brain because you think class, what, where's that? Where does that come from? So a lot of people do get them confused. So use classes order, general permitted development order, um, and it goes through a whole raft of classes in different schedules and different parts. So that is the basic principle of use classes, guide to use classes order and classes within the general permitted development order. 
I think that's a really good way of putting it and really helpful to help people understand the difference between a use class and a, uh, a permitted development class there as well, a, a general class order. So you mentioned a word there, permitted development. Now I hear people get confused and interchange permitted development and prior approval. Can you give an explanation what the difference is between the two? <laughs> ah, this, this, this fries my brain, this does. It's good, great question, Andrew. You know the right questions to ask. Right, so permitted development is, is just that. It means, uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's got sort of tied up with other stuff. Permitted, there are, I, in my head, and when I do my talking as I used to do traveling around the country not anymore I'm doing all of this from my kitchen table on zoom it's fabulous my car doesn't know what's hit it sat on the drive going what did I do I'm sorry you're not using me anymore it's fabulous um, you're on the Red Bull with the wings <laughs> yes oh don't oh don't we'll get done for standards trading or something Red Bull will be on the phone um, other brands exist you little monster. <laughs> energy drinks are available. <laughs> you little monster. If Red Bull want to give me a pit pass for the for the Formula One, I'd be very happy with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd be sitting on the wall with all the drivers. Lovely. Um, so, right. Permitted development. Permitted development and prior approval. Please, please don't get these uh, confused. Your permitted development in, in my head, and don't go looking for it in the regs because it doesn't exist, it falls into three categories. The first one is the true permitted development that you can go ahead, for example, class L in the general permitted development order allows you to go from a single dwelling house to a small HMO between three and six people without requiring planning permission. It's permitted development, nationally conferred. It comes down from on high, it comes from the central government, and it's nationally conferred throughout England. Yeah? Yep. So that is true permitted development. Now, we'll talk another time about um, Article 4 directions and removal of permitted development. Right? I know, uh, removal of permitted, but local councils, for example, you wouldn't expect to be able to do in the Cotswolds what you can do in central Birmingham. So each individual council has to have um, slightly different rules where they say, no, 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 you can't, you can't use that nationally conferred right here because our area just won't tolerate it. So it's, it's common sense. So we'll talk about that another time. So the next, there are three different types of permitted development. Now, let me go back and explain why it's still called permitted development, and it shouldn't be. Um, Eric Pickles, do you remember Eric Pickles, the former Communities and Local Government Secretary? Big short, short, dumpy little man. Yes, yeah. funny, funny, wrinkled up face. Um, he tried to get the prior approval and prior notification things through. Uh, they went through the Commons, couldn't get them through the House of Lords, kept trying and trying and trying, so could not get them as permitted development. The House of Lords went, nope, we're not having it. So what ended up happening is this hybrid application, which is not a full application, which is what, for example, office to residential, that's the one that everybody knows. And please don't call it commercial to residential, it's not. It, it's, if, it's, if it's an office, it's an office to residential. Uh, if it's a shop, it's a shops to residential. Don't keep using commercial, it drives me nuts. Um, so he was trying to get um, all of these things through under permitted development. So it would have been straight away, you can just go ahead and do it. And everybody was on the one hand getting excited about it because they thought, oh, that'll be quick. We don't need to bother with the council. But on the other hand, people were going, no, you can't do, this is gonna be an absolute car crash. It's not gonna work, we can't do this. So it came together into the middle, into a hybrid application that is a prior approval. That means you have to ask for the prior approval of the council before you and that's another thing it it also does what it says on the tin this is going to be my catchphrase isn't it um prior approval it means you have to ask 
the council's approval before you start anything. There's even a question on the form that says, has this development started? And if you put a no in the, in the no box, you put a tick in the no box, you, they'll just throw it out and go, you have to ask before you start anything. So in between this, there's, there's the true permitted development. Then there's something called no, neighbor notification or prior notification. This is another little hybrid thing and it's just for residential. Now, um, it might be for domestic, but it might be something that uh, landlords and developers could use if they're converting a house uh, into an HMO or they're converting it into a, a service accommodation, B&B, &B, something like that. Um, and it's for larger household extensions, single story, up to six meters on a semi-detached and a terrace, up to eight meters on a detached house. That is a much simplified planning application that you can go ahead, submit the application before you start anything. If there are no neighbor objections, within 42 days, the council have to give you their decision. If they haven't on the 43rd day, then you have consent by default. This is only for these prior notification, neighbor notification. So although it's badged permitted development, it's not. You have to still submit to the council. So larger household extensions, or larger domestic extensions, shall we say. But if you then decide to convert that house into an HMO, that's another matter. Finally, this prior approval. Now, I'll tell you what, people get confused with permitted development, prior approval, and pre-application. I know, I know, but they do because they come to me and, oh, I've put a pre-application console. Oh, have you? Are you asking the, uh, no, no, no. So, right, so prior approval means, and it, it is very specific. There are only very specific uh, things that you can do. Um, there are lots of classes within the general permitted development order that you can do permit, you can use permitted development rights for. The most popular one is Classo, and I keep going back to it, but it is the most popular one. There's also agricultural buildings as well. There's also light industrial buildings, but you've got to be careful with that because it's supposed to be coming to an end this October. I suspect it won't. I suspect it will get extended in the raft of new legislation that's going on. Um, so, but they cancelled the warehouse, the lighting, uh, the storage and warehouse to residential. That was cancelled. That was cancelled in June. So there are some permissions, prior approvals still about, but you can't go ahead and buy a light industrial unit now and do it. And this is all under this prior approval system. Again, it's a hybrid um, and you have to submit enough information to the council to satisfy them that this building can be converted from offices to residential, usually flats. Class C3. You cannot, under this, go from office to large HMO. It doesn't say it is only Class C3. It will not let you go from office to sui generis, which is what a large HMO would be. And a lot of people are getting planning permission for residential and C3 and then just converting it all internally um, and uh, getting into a bit of trouble sometimes. So that's permitted development rights, true. You don't need to go anywhere near a planning department for. That's the prior notification or neighbor notification, 42 days. And with the prior approval, again, in order to try and speed it up, there are no section 106 agreement obligations, requirements to pay, provide affordable housing. And um, there's a very minimal fee. So and uh, you get away with quite a lot of this and there's no requirement for um, place or room sizes like there are generally, especially in the London boroughs. So does that- In the, in the London yeah. boroughs, you do have to still pay the uh, accommodation creation charge if you're doing a commercial- Well, that's separate building. to planning, yeah. Absolutely, totally separate to planning. 
but I, I think that's a phenomenal introduction. And well, there's only one last thing that you know I'm going to ask because people get confused between outline planning and full planning. And, and it, it's understandable, to be honest, that, um, that, you know, there are some other things I don't understand quite as much with people getting confused about this one I do. Because, to be honest, people thought that outline planning permission had disappeared. And, and then, uh, relatively recently, two or three years ago, government introduced permission in principle. And you think, what? what's that? Now, a lot of bigger developers, if you're, if you're developing three, four, five hundred houses on a site, they will go in and negotiate with the council and get permission in principle. I understand that. But loads of people weren't bothering using outline planning permission. A lot of people thought it had, it had been done away with. It hasn't. It's still there. Um, the issue with outline versus uh, full and detailed planning. Right. OK. So your outline planning application is just that. You get a site, um, you want to put, I don't know, half a dozen houses on it, say. What you can do is just say where the access is going to be, and you can just put little boxes and a, maybe a bit of a road in a sketch, an illustrative scheme. And you can go to the council and you can say, right, I want planning, outline planning permission for this. You don't need to give any details, uh, any elevations. You need to say what sort of height and how many stories. So you need to give them a bit of a clue. If there's not an awful lot, if it's not very densely developed around and the council don't need to see where other windows are and it's going to fit on the site and it's not going to be cramped, um, then it's fairly easy for a council to deal with just an outline planning application. Literally, I got planning permission for about a dozen houses with literally an access, uh, a, uh, a main access road, driveway, and the houses in boxes dotted around, outline planning permission was granted. Now, once you've got outline planning permission, you have to then, and, they, and it usually lasts for three years, but councils can change that. What you then have to do is go in for what are called reserved matters. And the reserved matters are those issues that they, the council don't know about. Um, and they're the elevation, what the roof design is going to be like, what the material, where the windows are going to be, and all of the fine details. Um, so that can be done under your reserve matters and in total it's five years. So some people like that because it, it elongates the process if you like. Um, but at the beginning of the outline process that's when you deal with all the um, section 106 agreements, the contributions, if there's a community infrastructure levy payment, and if there's the mayor in the London boroughs, there's the mayor's community infrastructure levy that needs to be paid to fund Crossrail. So if there's any of these things, or if they want you to plant trees or you know, all sorts of things. So I've had all, that before. Yeah, it's a nightmare. All of those things need to be done at the outline stage and they will be agreed at the outline stage. So once you're doing the reserve matters, this is why a lot of people still like outline. Um, on the one hand, small developers will like it because they've got certainty. They know exactly how much their Section 106 is going to be, if that's what's required. They know exactly what the payment's going to be. They know that they've got planning permission for that number of buildings, and they can go ahead, put their stamp on it, and put, you know, say, well, we want to do two and a half stories on this one, and we want to put use this brick and this window detail. So a lot of small builders will like outline planning permissions, and a lot of people who are going to flip the uh, property, the land, uh, use outline planning permission, but not as much as they used to. So once you've done that, you then, the, the, the purchaser or the developer will go off, get reserve matters, and then you can build. But you can't build on an outlined planning permission. Now, so the full and detailed planning application is just that. They will ask you for everything. So you need to submit all of the details, the design details, the windows, the roof design, the layout, everything. Um, so that's the basic principle. Now, if you submit an outline planning application and the council believes 
that they can't deal with an outline application. They need more information and it can't, for example, if it's in a conservation area, and they say, no, we can't deal with an outline because we need to know what it's going to look like. We need to know how it's going to impact the neighbours. There's lots of neighbours around. So the council has the power to write back to you within 28 days of receiving an outline and say, no, we can't accept an outline. It's got to be full and detailed. So you have to be careful. You can't use an outline application everywhere. Um, but a lot of the time, yes, if it suits your purpose and you're not wanting to go in immediately and build, but just be aware you cannot build immediately on just an outline planning application. So it almost sounds a bit tactical here that you could secure a site, add the outline planning permission and use that as a trading point, allowing the purchaser to basically design the scope of the materials and the look and the feel of the site. Yeah. Or you could use it to secure the site for yourself, knowing that once you've got that, you can then start to work on the details, cutting the costs and the time frame down as a tactical way of, of doing things. When I say the costs and the time frame, that, that's to actually securing the right to be able to do it, yeah. rather than having to go into the detail with architects and, and everybody to work out what brick type where the windows are going to be and everything yeah. secure it and then go back and put the detail onto the drawing yeah and that's true however with a lot of outlines you're still going to have to do things like um if it's anywhere in a flood zone you're going to have to do an environmental um, assessment from a flood risk point of view if there are creatures or something on site you're going to have to do an ecological report so all of the stuff that will have to be done for full and detailed has to be done up front because that's the only way the, the planners can tell whether it's a developable site um yeah. but yes it, it does it gives it's um a, a lot of people that I've dealt with who are uh, smaller developers say it's it's they put it in their back pocket and go right I might be able to use that they sometimes use it as collateral because it's obviously once it's got planning permission it's got a value um, and it's what is somebody else said it's a bird in the hand um, and you know I can I can use that I now know for the the next few years I can forget about it and then I can go back to it and submit the reserve masses but you have to keep an eye on the on the time scales. Brilliant well I think that just about wraps up our introductions Linda <laughs> and I don't know about you but I don't think any of that was pants. <laughs> Thank you Dalek. I think it was all very well then. I think it was very valuable information and the audience are going to get a phenomenal value from that. Thank you, darling. Well, I do hope so. And if we have any requests on a postcard, <laughs> when you put this out, we can, uh, if anybody's going to say, really we're both traditional, we watch Swap Shop and Tis Was. Tis, oh, God, yeah, don't. God, that dates us, doesn't it? Well, it, <laughs> yeah, I was probably, I was probably about 16 when I was watching that. You were probably a lot younger, darling. Oh, you're so sweet, Linda. I'm sure we're about the same. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> On that note. Shh. All right. Yes. Fabulous. Lovely talking to you. Thanks, guys. See you again soon. Bye-bye.